Hi everyone, great, uh, so many people in the audience, it's so great to see, and uh, obviously with me at Petri, I mean it's amazing to have you here next to me, and uh, with the news that came out yesterday as well, that Aura raised 75 million dollars uh, to a 5 billion dollar valuation, that's like, are you the biggest direct-to-consumer startup in like the whole of Europe now? Maybe. Yeah. So I'm going to test you here in the audience. Um, how many of you, raise a hand, has an aura ring? Yeah. Uh, I guess you all care about your HRV balance and so on. I obviously do as well. Uh, so, I mean, Petri, I mean, how, how come you sold about over 2.5 million rings, maybe 3 million? I mean, how, how did aura get to this kind of success, do you think? What's the most important? One of the most important things is the genuine intention to do something very meaningful. So to create something that really brings real, genuine benefits to the end, u end user. And then combining that together with a user value-centric approach or user value-centric design in every step of the development of the product. Don't you think that every startup thinks that they are doing that? Maybe, but what it means in practice is that you really have to dig deep into the understanding that what your target audience, and especially your optimal target audience, what they really need, they cannot communicate it to you. You have to find it out yourself. Like, for example, when we were entering the market, all the variables were measuring activity. And our approach was completely different. We knew from long research what we did and experimenting existing devices and so on. We knew that people would benefit more from the understanding that we can generate from sleep and recovery. So how well they recover from their daily mental and physical strain. So therefore, we pushed through this with this mission and, of course, I would say maturity of investors and, and basically all the people, they say that, what are you doing? Why, why don't you do like all the others? Measure from the wrist and measure your activity. Why don't you do like all the others? So it was really hard in the beginning to convince everyone that this is the right approach. And that's what I mean with, with very user value-centric design. So you have to go far beyond even the understanding of, the, of your target audience currently, that what they actually need. Yeah, did, was it hard to persuade both the customers and your investors that what, that was actually what they wanted? It was really hard, yeah. really, really hard. But eventually we started finding such people who, who let's say, spoke the same language. And, and some of those people were from this uh, quantified self movement in San Francisco. We were meeting those people, and then it, it kind of grew to biohacking and, and self optimization. So, so we were in resonance with, with those people. So they understood our approach, and, and they kind of helped us to, to form the product mm -hmm. as well. So I think many startups uh, obviously ask customers what they want and try to build a thing out of that. And you, but it, when you ask customers, they always say things that they don't really want, but they, exactly. you know. So exactly. how did you actually find out, like, how did you do that? That requires ambition to, to go deep into the understanding, in Aura's case, to the science, technology, design, wearing comfort. So you have to find a way that how you create the biggest value to the end user. So it, 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 it's hard work, but it's the only way for you to, to really develop something that provides high value to the end user. Mm -hmm. So if you ask 
people, okay, how it should be, what, what are you looking for? They cannot tell because they don't have the experience about such a product that is highly valuable for them. Mm. So when you chose sleep, obviously since then you added activity, you have loads of different things. I mean, yes. we all follow it, right? Yes. Uh, and, uh, and now you also added like low-cost monitoring uh, through Dexcom, or, you know. So how could you focus on the one thing? Because I think that's usually a problem, right? Because you, you want to give your customers everything all at once. So how, how did you plan that ahead and be able to just focus on getting the one thing right first? It goes back to the intention and your ambition, that what you're really solving. So you have to stay focused on those main benefits that you can produce. So when you dig deep into the, into the science and also you get feedback from the users when they use it, you, you see from the data that how are they really getting value? And of course, the high retention rates, like in case of Aura, is three to four times higher than any other wearable. The retention tells that people are really valuing the product. Uh, so you have to carefully think that, OK, what, what adds value on top of this? And Aura has been now collecting very accurate, highly accurate biosignal data and behavioral data almost 10 years. So think about that. First from tens of thousands, then hundreds of thousands, now from millions of people, every night, every day, 24-7. Aura gets huge amount of very highly accurate data. And today we talk a lot about, about AI. And AI is, is nothing without data. So Aura is, is very well positioned in the marketplace. And from there, we can derive more and more insights that bring value to the user. So how do we in the audience think about sharing all that data with you? Not getting more back, you know, we are getting something back, obviously. Yes, yes, you will, you will get it back as new features that, that you can find really valuable. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, throughout this journey, obviously, 2013, you found it, and then you've been operational until like four years ago. Um, but during that kind of the first few years, what kind of mistakes did you make? Like, was it features? Was it like the product itself? I mean, uh... plenty of mistakes. Name one. <laughs> of course, iterating the product is, is really hard. We knew that developing hardware is hard, but we found out that developing the app is even harder. So, so to make that kind of real user experience that makes the user to commit to this kind of self-reflection, self-realization process, because that's what Aura kind of demands from the user. So it's not a simple and easy product in a sense that it, it's demanding for the user because you have to commit to your own health journey. And Aura is, is a companion there. So we had to understand this aspect so not just polishing the, how, how it looks like, but how it lives with you as a companion in your everyday life and gives you insights and guidance that how you can improve the quality of your life. So that was a long journey to really make it work well. And current Aura app, is, it is still the same that we launched in this States seven years ago. It's basically the same, uh, but of course there are added parts and more polishing and so on, but, but the core is the same. So you're kind of happy with the first result then? In this? Yeah, or we, this, this long iteration process ended up being very successful, even though we, we did lots of mistakes or, I, I, I don't know whether they can be called mistakes, but, but lots of findings that, that this doesn't work, this doesn't work, but this, this may work. So you obviously, I mean, you're not just a co-founder of Aura, you also do lots of investments in startups and so on. And what do, you, what do you think that startups do wrong in focusing in? What is there the kind of, what should they focus on and what should they focus on? I mean, user-centric, yes, but is there other things as well? I would say that this, this user value-centric approach, it goes to every function of the company. 
So you should always concentrate on the value that you create to the end user and continuously iterate improving it. That's the only way that you can ensure the success. So in every function of the company, you, you, need, to, you need to kind of meet people a lot. You need to discuss about the solution. You have to show, you have to try to understand that are we in the right track and so on. Um, it is kind of a DNA of the, the whole company and the whole product, whole user experience. And it goes with the branding as well. So I think many startup companies, they, they kind of see them as separate things, but they are actually the same, same thing. So, so branding needs to be thought of in every function, like marketing as well. The best marketing is that when you create such a user experience, that the user kind of can reveal something of themselves that they didn't know before. So then it becomes, it, it is such a transformative experience that he or she wants to tell about the product to everyone. So is there any better marketing? So in that sense, marketing also, it, it's, it, it is in every function of the company. I remember interviewing uh, Tom Hale, the CEO of Aura last year, and he was saying that, you know, they spent quite a lot of marketing the year before, and obviously we had a financial crisis and starting cutting things. And we realized that first cutting like 10% of marketing, nothing happened, the same, the same growth. Yes. Then 50%, still the same growth. Yes. And it meant like, well, you're actually mainly growing of word of mouth, right? Yes, exactly, yes. I think still around 60% of all the sales comes through references from existing users. And that has been the, the same for all the time. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously when you first tried out to get investors here in uh, Finland and so on, people weren't very keen on, you know, investing in this hardware ring. Yes. You and you uh, ended up going to the US. Yes. And like, you still now haven't really focused on like selling in Europe. I mean, yeah. Finland and uh, VCs and yeah. tech world obviously knows yes. about you, yes. but like, yes. When you talk to people on the streets of uh, London or Copenhagen yeah, yes. or Stockholm, they don't really know, and yes. they don't even know that Aura is Finnish. Exactly. Uh, yes. Yes. I mean, do you think that's going to be the next step after the US, or will you go to like Asia then? Like, um, I think Aura has been sold in in more than 200 countries already. So, but but the truth is that that what comes to marketing and, and kind of building the presence in the marketplace, vast majority of, of all the work has been done in the US. Yeah. And that was kind of intentional decision in the very beginning, that we, we understood that if we want to succeed in this market, we have to go to US right away. So basically from day one, we have been doing everything in the US. We launched in the launch festival in 2015, uh, it's the first time from the stealth company. And then we had Kickstarter in, in August, September the same year. And we did lots of footwork in between and after that. So, and, and I think it was, it was mandatory to go that route. Yeah. So when we talk about the US, it would be also nice if anyone who has a competitor ring to Aura could raise a hand. Is does anyone actually no, I'm talking about no. There are a few competitors to you, yes. right? And there's, there's more coming. You know, we talk about like Samsung, Apple are thinking about it maybe, I don't know. But uh, I mean, how do you feel about that competition? Because it's kind of like it, they have deep pockets as well, right? Yeah, I welcome everyone because there's lots of space in this. Um, we are in the early phases of, of saturating the market with rings or watches or whatever health products. So we are in the early phases of, of creating value. And, and Aura has around 10 years of uh, data already, huge amount of data. And, and that's an asset that no one else basically has. So we can, we can continue building more and more really valuable features uh, and be, be kind of a number one choice for, for a long time for many people. But I welcome everyone to this market because we are creating the market together. 
Okay, that's positive. I mean, is it not, are none of these big companies have wanted to acquire Aura then over the years? Yeah, it may have happened several times, but but I think we our ambition level is to, to really solve something very big problems like chronic diseases, uh, like diabetes, is something that early on we had a vision that we have to solve this problem. This is a huge challenge that we need to really find solution to this. So the diabetes obviously comes, came in early yes. and you still focus on the sleep and now, now, like yesterday, you actually got the glucose meter. Exactly. I mean, yeah. is that a win for you specifically, do you think? Yes, I think it is, especially because the companies will be sharing the data so that together, I hope, they can bring much more value not only to, to diabetes patients, but also to prevent diabetes as a disease. Mm. So this whole thing about longevity that we usually talk about, how do you think that Aura fits into that? No. Very well, because we built um, baselines of, of the most important biosignals and your sleep quality, readiness and so on for each individual. And as, as we know, we are all unique our lifestyles are unique, so we can really personalize the experience to everyone to really make sure that we, we create value. And in the longer term, all, all heart, heart health related stuff and other things coming from this metabolic health, all these are great opportunities to, to create something that completely brings something new and, and transformative into the market. Yeah, no. And uh, I suppose like everyone is talking about Ozempic, but maybe you can just be something else then. <laughs> yeah, uh, Aura is a healthy way to, to, let's say, increase the quality of your life. So I would, I would go that way. Yeah, and uh, when you talk about like the retention and getting people to stay with you, what do you think is, I mean, yes, the user centric, but how exactly do you get people to actually stay on? I mean, to pay yeah. this kind of subscription basis mm. and, and so on. I mean. Yeah. It starts early on. You have to really make sure that you understand your optimal target audience. You have to do careful uh, work to, to really understand that you can, you can bring that high value that makes them stick with the product uh, long enough so that you can expand to, to other user groups. And, and then still keep up uh, providing them new value so that they, they still continue using it. So I think some people have been using Aura uh, since 2015, 16 already. So that's quite a long time. And, and it's, a, it's really a commitment. Uh, and um, the data that they have collected during that time is really valuable. So if they start to develop some condition or something happens in their life, that data will bring lots of value to them. So when you talk about like, obviously when you get these kind of really famous people wearing, or not, you don't get them to do it, but they do it, like Prince Harry in the UK. I mean, what does it mean for uh, you, like Aura as a brand? I mean, how, how much is things taking off then, do you think? I mean, if you've been looking back. Prince Harry is a, is a special case because um, for me it's actually a validation of the genuine intention that we had in creating the product. So, because he is a person that you cannot influence in any way. So, in practice, it means that he got such a transformative user experience, maybe learned something about himself with the product, so that he wanted to deliver a message to, to the market that here is a product that helps you to stay healthy. So he actually delivered that message through his doctor to us, that don't talk about my ring, but talk about this product, that how it can help young adults like himself to stay healthy. And, he, and you didn't pay him to wear it? No, we didn't pay. We didn't even meet him. <laughs> so, so, but of course, we, we knew his doctor. Yeah. So uh, it helped us to get there. 
but we didn't pay anything or we didn't influence his decision to to go viral to 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 wear the ring when they went for the global tour so that was of course huge thing for aura because in five days we got something like uh, 486 million global media hits which is as a marketing equivalent it's worth 10.5 million euros in five days so it was a huge thing for us of course so looking back i mean if you uh, obviously launched the ring in 2015 now it's soon 2025 uh, it's been 10 years mm. do you think you could have done anything different that you would have grown quicker maybe <laughs> But we haven't tried that through, so, so <laughs> hard to tell. Well, you're now also an angel investor to about yes. 30 startups. I mean, what are you saying to them? Like, because I suppose you, you have it in you to be able to be like, maybe push like this instead um, of do this. And yeah, I, most of the times I say that calm down, calm down. There is market. You don't need to worry about that. You, you are not losing anything. The market window. Many times you hear that the market window is very narrow. You have to go to that market window. But I can ensure you that that if you concentrate on bringing high value to some certain user group or, or target audience, you don't need to worry about competition or the market facing or anything like that. You will always find your customers. Yeah. So how come you uh, decided to? Uh, to like go into like helping other startups and investing in other startups and stay on st staying with Aura, do you think? Was it? I think myself and, and, and my founder colleagues and, and our early employees, we are more like pioneers who want to create something new. And also that it, it has been such a learning experience that we want to share that with others. And once the company grows to that size as, as Aura is today, there are much more capable people to lead the operations. And, and for me, it's, it's, it's not that, I'm not passionate about that kind of thing. No. So, so I want to keep up doing things that I'm passionate about. Do you ever think that Aura uh, is now seen more like a US brand? Do you think that maybe that they don't know that it's finished? Do you ever worry about that? that no, I don't worry about that because eventually they will find out that it's, it's a finish. <laughs> and, and fortunately, current top management, they, they also want to, people to know that it is a Finnish brand and a Finnish company, or it's a Finnish company anyhow. Is that a strength? Definitely it is. Why? Aura would not have been able to born in anywhere else than in Finland. Because we have long history in, in, in physiological sciences, like, like Polar has been heading that for a long time. Many universities uh, have been pioneering there. And also Nokia has created lots of uh, technology uh, background and, and many other companies. So when we started, we had the opportunity to, to utilize such resources that we couldn't have found anywhere else. And also the kind of facilities like, like uh, Nokia, behind Nokia we, we found, let's say, big labs with, with the best equipment to test the device and so on. So, so all that has helped us to create something uh, transformative. Do you feel now that you know, 10 years on after the launch, that you and your co-founders become some kind of like, that you are able to push the Finnish ecosystem further because of your success? That's my ambition. I, I'm willing to do everything to support this ecosystem here uh, and to, to, to help other companies succeed. So you heard him, just uh, come and uh, grab him after this. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Petteri. It's thank been you. an uh, absolute honor to, well, to have you here. It's been thank great you. to talk to you and talk about the success of Aura. Thank you. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'll keep checking my HRV balance. Yes. Thank, <laughs> thank you, Thank you Mimi. very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.